And he says, when you pray, don't be like the heathen who thinks that they're going to be heard because of their much speaking. He says, abstain, refrain, don't use vain repetitions. Okay, And then right after that, he says, because of their much speaking. So he's saying the same thing over and over and over again. Okay, Then, verse number 9, Jesus said, after this manner, pray ye. Or in other words, here's an example. Okay, I've given you several of those, usually in every Sunday school class. Doesn't mean go out and use that exact same example from here until the end of time. But there are certain people that believe you've got to say this prayer word for word as it was when Jesus said it. And as long as you do that, God will be happy with it. Well, not according to two verses before he started it. But anyway, we I've got that out of my system. So, another thing I noticed, okay, in your Bible, in verse number 9, hallowed should be capitalized. That is a name of God. Not saying that his name should be hallowed. No, 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 no. It already is because that's his name. One of the names of God. Okay, his name is so high that, you know, what we would say reverence or, you know, fealty, right? Just sheer awe of who he is. We might say that, you know, somebody else's name might be hallowed. But no, no, no. He's so much hallowed that that's just, his, he's the standard. That's his name. Okay? Just another thing I'm throwing out, and we're not going to teach on that, but. Something I saw when reading. Okay, verse number 10. Thy kingdom come, which it will. And if you believe like I do, I believe that some of the ink in the last chapter of the history of this thing that we called earth has already started to dry. It hadn't been finished yet, but we pretty close. All right, we're not waiting on, you know, another volume to come out. I think we're in the last couple of pages. Okay, I mean, God himself said 70 years was a generation. He extended it for 40. Israel became a nation back in the 40s. Okay, trust me, you did the math, and I've done the math in the Hebrew calendar. I don't know if it's right, because I don't know if the Jews have kept the Hebrew calendar correct for the entire time. But uh, time ran out in April of 2018, according to that. God said you live above 70, you're blessed. The only reason that he hadn't come is because of the mercy, long-suffering, grace, and the love that God has for sinners. I mean, it just literally could be any second. Come up hither, and we gone. I think we're going to be gone before he can finish thither. Right, but anyway, just enough, just enough thought, Jordan had. Uh, Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Now keep in mind, it's Jesus talking. Okay, so when he prays, who's he pray to? The Father. In fact, the Bible tells you that he is seated at the right hand of God making intercession for the saints. Who's that? That's saved folk. That's us. Even to this day, Jesus is still praying to the Father for you and for me. Right, and surely you would think that if God asked God something, God would do it. So what? stops God from doing what God wants to do well Jesus said thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven in heaven God's will is done all the time there's nothing else it's just that's the way God wants it that's the way that it is you know what cherubims do they guard the throne of God you know why because that's what God created them for and they do the will of God right? but you know what seraphims do well, they got six wings. They cover themselves with four of them so that they don't draw any attention to themselves. They use the other two to fly around the throne of God and they just proclaim how holy he is. Yeah. You know why they do that? Because that's what God made them for and they do the will of God. Amen. You know why birds sing? Because that's what God made them do and they do the will of God. Even rocks will cry out and praise God in our stead if we don't yeah. because that's the will of God. So Jesus is praying... Father, I pray that your will be done here as it is in heaven. See, there's no other thought in heaven. 
God solved that problem when he kicked Lucifer and a third of the angels out. Those were the only ones that had thought different than doing the will of God. And God said, this is my domain. This is my realm. His throne's in the sides of the north. I have all power. My will's done here. So he kicked Lucifer out. Okay? I don't know how hard he hit, but he hit hard. And he's been angry ever since. In fact, until Lucifer rebelled, everything that had ever been created had always done the will of God. Until Eve succumbed to temptation and sinned in the garden, man always did the will of God. Jesus is praying, when ye pray, first off, reverence God, if you've ever heard the model prayer taught on, show God do reverence, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. What's that? That's submission. Not my will, but thine, Lord. I don't want my kingdom. I want thy kingdom. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Jesus says, you should pray that. Or after that manner. When he says after that manner, he's saying, the words can be different. What matters is the intent of your heart. Okay, well, let's take a step back. Matthew was written to the Jews. We know that. It was the gospel written to the Jews to prove that Jesus was the Messiah. Okay, so in context, everything in Matthew is written to God's chosen people. So he's telling God's children, the nation of Israel, okay, the Hebrews, he's telling them, when you pray to your father, because it was also his father. He chose them. He said, when you pray, don't be like the heathens. Who's the heathens? People that didn't believe in God. People that believed in something other than Jehovah. Okay, well then, if you're like me, you've had the thought, well then, why do people get so obsessed with this prayer when it was given to the Jews? Because later on you find out the world chosen generation, a royal priesthood. We have been adopted into the family of God, thus we have a claim through the same blessing that Abraham got because there was a kinsman redeemer one day and there's this lady named Ruth. Okay, Gentiles can get in too because Jesus saved, you know, grafted in a vine for them. So, it still applies to us. So he says when you pray, Pray that the will of God be done in earth as it is in heaven. Means that nobody thinks about not doing it. Nobody thinks about doing it in a different way. However God wants it done, when God wants it done, exactly in the mode that God wants it done, the will of God be done. So when he says that, how do we pray that? Well, First off, if it's in your heart, you're going to stop thinking of things in terms of outcomes. Right? Got to be very careful praying for a specific outcome because if that's not the will of God, you can grieve God. And if God is grieved in your life, you've got bigger problems. Right? Those that do it ignorantly, God may wink at their ignorance. But once they know, we know better than that. I've stopped praying for you know, this may sound crass or crude, but I've stopped praying that God make people better. I say, Lord, thy will be done. You say, why? Well, it might be God's will to take them home. Is it selfish of me to keep them from getting everything that I've ever wanted? Because that's what they'll graduate to. Right? When we pray against or not in the will of God, what we're saying to God is, I know better. Or we're showing our ignorance because we don't know what the will of God is. He says our desire should be so much not to just everybody know the will of God. Not just that everybody understand what the will of God is and how God would want it, but that it be done in earth as it is in heaven. I'm convinced you walk into heaven, you know who owns it? Because everything that he wants gets done. 
He could do it all himself because he's all powerful. But he chooses because it's his will to have things done that way. Right? It was the will of the Father for the Son to come, be born of a virgin, be saint, slain or sacrificed on a cross for the sins of all mankind, pay for that sin debt, then raise from the dead, take the blood, put it on the mercy seat in heaven, because there's a mercy seat in heaven just like there was on the Ark of the Covenant. That's what the one on the Ark of the Covenant was supposed to symbolize, the mercy seat in heaven. And it's still there to this day. Right? That was the will of God. We know that it's the will of God that none should perish, but that all should come to repentance. For God so loved the world. Right? There are certain things we know the will of God. But then how convinced are you that that's the, the will of God? I mean, convinced, another word for that is uh, conviction. It's all that that word means. People don't like that word because they usually don't like the way the conviction feels. But all that conviction is, is the Holy Ghost convincing you of what God said or what the Bible says or what the preacher preached is true. And once you're convinced, you'll live like it's true. See, the reason that most people don't pray the will of God, the reason that most people don't even know the will of God for their life, is because they're not convinced that it's important. Jesus said it's so important that it should be done and we should have the desire for us to do the will of God just as if we were in heaven. Just as if he were in front of us. Just as if I wasn't limited by flesh and sin and you know this thing called the curse. Now, I may not be able to be in the perfect will of God because he wants me to be just like his son. That's not going to happen until one of these days when I get a body like his. But for the meantime, I'm robed in his righteousness so that God doesn't see me, he sees Jesus. That's good enough. But see, if I'm not convinced that it's important, a lot of people talk about it. A lot of people try and tell you what the will of God is for your life. Don't trust that joker. But there are some things that it's the will of God to happen. But then there's specific calls in your life. Right? There's service that God may call you to. Right? I mean, God may call you to, in a moment, to pray for somebody else, to call somebody on the telephone. Right? The will of God, it's both set in stone and it fluctuates in different ways. There are the foundations that are forever settled in heaven. That's going to be the will of God. Then there's the personal will of God that it changes depending on which person it is. Because God didn't save us to make us carbon copies. God saved us as individuals so that we could individually go out and represent Him as an ambassador of Christ. So if He knew that we were all different, why would He want us all to do the exact same thing? Right? We're not all supposed to talk the same way and be you know, monotoned and robotic and you know, act like we came out of a summer camp where they brainwashed us all. Right? God wanted us to be different. And He wanted us to be fitly framed together so that our differences could all be used to the glory and honor of God. That we would be one body totally sold out to doing the will of God. Right? So with the Lord's help this morning, we're going to teach on the will of God. The will of God. Now, I'm going to go a few places. If you want to, you can turn... There with me. Good place to start. Romans chapter number 12. Verses 1 and 2. Okay, the Apostle Paul writes, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Well, before we can even get to the will of God, we've got to get to what it takes to do the will of God. In order to do the will of God, we've got to be right with God. And not right as modern Christianity will define right, which is you're just not out there living in wicked open sin. But right with God according to God's standards. 
What was the commandment? Be ye holy, for I am holy. It is the will of God that we be presented as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. Okay, that holy, by the way, is H-O-L-Y, not W. So holy as Him. Not holy as in fully. Holy as in He is holy. I desire to be holy. The living sacrifice. Why do you think Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me? Because daily I must sacrifice the old man. Daily I have to suppress my will. Daily I have to suppress my desires. And by choosing not to act on them, by sacrificing those things, I show that I care about his will more than my will. Then it says, a living sacrifice, holy. I mean, we could spend, I don't know how many months on holy. But you know what holy is? You're what God wants you to be, nothing else, nothing less. Totally sold out, which is the next part. But holy. How many holy Christians walking around today? Not enough. Don't know how many there are, because man looks on the outward appearance, God looks on the heart. I can't judge who is and who isn't. But you know whether you are or you aren't. In order to do the will of God, I've got to do it the way that He wants me to. You know what that standard is? Holy. Because after that He says, acceptable. Present our bodies a living sacrifice. Holy, comma, acceptable unto God. You know what that means? It pleases God. That God looks at it and says, that's the way that I wanted it done. You know what that means? I can't be involved in planning out how it needs to be done. I just have to do it as the Master tells me. Doesn't matter what I think of it or if I think that it makes sense or I think that I should say more or say less. Doesn't matter if I think that, you know, maybe I'm going to go over and talk to that person again about the Lord today. Maybe the Lord's working on them on the inside and you're just going to be a distraction. Maybe they're going to see you as somebody that's pestering them and then it's going to shut off whatever God was doing on the inside. Or maybe God opens the door, but we don't want to walk through it. That's not acceptable. Holy and then acceptable could also be read as obedient. And we know that obedience is greater than sacrifice. I may not be what he wants me to be completely yet. But I am robed in the righteousness of Christ. If I confess my sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. So I may not be in that body like his, but I can be obedient. Doesn't matter if you've been saved a second or a lifetime, every Christian's able to be obedient. May not understand the Bible as well as somebody else. You may not have all the maturity and all the growth and the plateaus that our pastor talks about in your spiritual life. Doesn't matter where you are, you can be obedient. And let me help you with something. Before God will give you much, you have to be shown to be obedient with little. Godliness with contentment is great gain, but those that are content with what they have, I've found that God just tends to bless them with more because they're the ones that appreciate it and act on what God gives them. That's not just talking about this or talking about stuff. It's talking about responsibilities too. Those that are just content to give everything that they have to what God's trusting them with, they're that servant that took ten and turned it into ten more. And five, and into five, they didn't bury it in the sand. They said, God's entrusted me with this. I want to be acceptable unto God in this. And because they were obedient and God found it acceptable, God will give them more. God thinks very highly of you. We're going to rule and reign with Christ in the millennial reign. We've been made joint heirs to the throne of Jesus Christ himself. You know what throne that is, by the way? The throne that's in the sides of the north. 
God thinks very highly of you. So when He entrusts it to you, He sees your potential and He knows that you can do it. He even said that in and of ourselves we wouldn't be able to do it because the arm of flesh will fail you. But He did promise that I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. He said, I'll even help you do the things that I ask you to do. You know what all of that is? Being holy and acceptable unto God. And you know why we strive to be those things? He said, I beseech ye, therefore, brethren, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice. Why? He says, that sacrifice should be holy and acceptable unto God. And it's our reasonable service because we've been bought with a price. He says, be not conformed to this world. In other words, be that peculiar people, that chosen generation, that royal priesthood. Be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Be refreshed, right, daily. Return to that fountain that we, we can get a drink of living water so that we can stay focused on what's important. Keep our hearts set on heavenly things. Why? That ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. To prove something means to test it or to try it out and show that it's good. You know why we present ourselves a living sacrifice? So that I can do and prove to others that the will of God is good, acceptable, perfect, complete. That outside of that, whatever you do in your life, you're going to be wanting. There's going to be something missing. You're going to come up short somewhere because the only way to live is according to the will of God. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And so before we can even get to what the will of God is, right, we've got to be in the position to do it. Now thankfully, God's understanding. He starts us off small. Right, you first get saved, it's God's will for you to get in the word of God. He doesn't expect you to understand as much as somebody that's been reading the Word of God for decades. But as we mature, the responsibility should increase because we've been shown to be faithful and acceptable in what God wants us to do. We'll save that for a minute. We're not going to go down that path yet. But next, 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4. 1 Thessalonians Chapter number 4. We've talked about the preparation for the will of God. Now in 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4, verse number 3, for this is the will of God. Stop. Right? Seems like if the Apostle Paul was inspired to write, hey, here's the will of God for you, we all might take it, you know, little note pay attention to this one okay, he's about ready to make it very plain he says for this is the will of God even your sanctification well what's sanctification that means separated for God's sole use you know what that sounds like a living sacrifice wholly acceptable unto God we sacrifice the fact that we could use what God gave us and how God made us for worldly things or for things to advance our own desires. But no, we've been sanctified unto Him. Meaning, we're only used for one thing, the will of God. He said, that's the will of God, even your sanctification. Okay, then he goes on to say, that you should abstain from fornication. Okay, now keep in mind, he's writing to a Gentile church in the middle of a whole bunch of heathens. Okay? Certainly it's the will of God for you not to you know, be fornicating after the flesh, right? as the world would call it. God don't want you sleeping around, but here he's talking about spiritual fornication. He's saying it's easy in a world where you're surrounded by people that don't believe in God. They're heathens. Or they're heretics. They claim to know God, but they've changed the word of God to make God something different than who God is. He says, those people around you all day long. Right? This was the only church in Thessalonica when it started. 
Right? This was the only place that was preaching what God had done for mankind, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so, very easy to fall back into old lifestyles. Very easy for friends to draw us away from the things, for our desires to be set back on worldly things. So when he says fornication, he's saying, abstain from it. In other words, be faithful. Because the definition of fornication is to become unfaithful to something else. You can't commit fornication unless you've committed yourself to something already. So, what is faithfulness? Right, well, you've heard Dad give the illustration. I don't have an example like this, but this one's pretty good. Right? You can't go to your spouse and say, well, I've been pretty faithful this week. I mean, Proverbs said it this way. I believe it's Proverbs chapter number 5. Right? Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, all thy soul, all thy mind, and lean not unto thine own understanding. You know what abstaining from fornication is? God, here's my everything. Because th God just expects you to do what you can do. No more, no less. He's got a very simple standard. What you're capable of. The sad thing is, is that most of the time we hold ourselves back because we think that we're not capable of what God knows that we are because we think so little of ourselves. I get it. I live with myself every day. I know all my problems. That other people don't know them. But because I know my faults, sometimes I let my faults get in the way of my potential. Because I know that, you know, that's going to be a little bit hard because I know my weaknesses and I'm going to have to deal with those while I'm doing that. So I try to move the bar lower, but God says, no, I know you're capable of it. He said, we're yoked up together. He said, I, I'm indwelling you through the Holy Spirit. You know, Jesus said, wherever you go, lo, I am with you always. Not always, always. You know what that means? All the time. Amen. Then, it goes on to say in 1 Thessalonians, right, to abstain from fornication, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. There's responsibility there. It's the will of God for you to possess your vessel in sanctification and honor. We've already dealt with sanctification. But what's the, the vessel? That's his flesh. It is ourselves. I am a vessel for God to use for his honor and his glory. Pot doesn't get to decide what goes in the pot. That's the chef's job. Right? The flower vase doesn't decide which flowers get planted in it. It's just the vase. But what he says is that you know how to possess your vessel. In other words, you know how to rule and reign over this body as that king that he made you. That you know how to handle the desires of the flesh. You know how to overcome temptation. Because in every temptation, he makes a way of escape. Because God doesn't let us be tempted above what we're able. And we know that God doesn't tempt us. That's the devil. That's his flesh. That's the world. But we do know that he gave us something stronger than temptation. You know what that is? Faith, hope, joy, peace, long-suffering, so that even though we don't enjoy it, we can suffer through the temptation because we know it's sweeter to have him than to give in to the temptation. Possess your vessel. Have control over it. You are fully capable of utilizing what God gave you. Right? The Word of God is referred to as a sword. We should know how to wield it when it comes to ourselves. Amen. I know that when something flares up or comes up, or if there's something in my life, I know how to use the sword to nip it in the bud so that it doesn't sprout, it doesn't take root. I know how to keep my vessel sanctified unto God. He says, that's the will of God. So many people are going out and trying to do things for God, but God's not going to use the vessel because it's not holy and sanctified unto Him. 
It hasn't been reserved for his use and it hadn't been kept up to the standard that God wants to. You don't plant flowers in a dirty pot because what's dirty in there can kill the flowers. You don't cook in a dirty pot because you want to taste what you're putting in, not what was in there the last time you cooked. And you certainly don't want it if it started sprouting stuff and getting moldy and boo. Right? Possess your vessel. Yeah, we're going to get used for His honor and His glory. I'm a vessel that doesn't draw any attention to itself. I'm a vessel that reflects the one that uses the vessel. You know, that means humility. That meekness. Lowliness. Submission. Servitude. Saying, I don't want eyes on me. Make me plain. Make me nothing special so that they see that you're the thing that's special about me. Well, then, goes on to say, verse number five, not in the lust of concupiscence. I hate that word. It's hard to say. Even as the Gentiles which know not God. See, some people are all about possessing their own vessel after the lust of self-promotion, self-edification, self-pleasure. But that word that I hate saying, you know what it means? It means living as you see, you know, best fit. The lust of it is, is that I'm trying to get the most joy out of life. According to me. According to the flesh. According to the desires of the carnal man. God says that you possess your vessel in honor, not to glorify you. Not to bring glory and honor to a place or a congregation but for one sole purpose that God's will be done and that he get the glory for it part of it may be I mean everybody let's try to think of a good example we were talking about examples earlier can't think of one now right you put seeds into a pump well most of us don't do that anymore most of y'all go down to Lowe's and you get one that somebody's already started growing. Okay, and it's about this big. And then you go home and put it in a pot or you plant it in a flower bed. Right? But back in the day, they'd take a seed and put it into that vessel. And then they'd water it. They'd sit it out in sunlight. And then, if the weather changed, they'd bring it inside so it didn't get frost bit. They'd take care of it through the winter. Right, and eventually a little green leaf would sprout and then, you know, lo and behold, one day there might be a whole bunch of lilies in there. Most of us don't like just being filled with dirt and a seed. We want people to walk by and say, now that pot's doing something. The person that put the seed in there knows that something's happening that people can't see. Right, God put a treasure in us. That's what the Bible says. The mystery of God, in fact, is that God chose to put the treasure of God into earthen vessels. But just because others can't see what's going on, God knows what's going on. Outwardly, may not be doing, you just may be faithful, may be doing what God wants you to do, but at home at night, you're laboring, praying for others. Right? You're grabbing the horns of the altar, begging God to show you what you need out of the Word of God. Right? You're asking God to teach you those things and you're becoming more mature. Right? But what's going on inside of the pot has no effect on the vessel. Whether we got a whole bunch of lilies so that Jesus can be the lily for somebody's valley. Whether we're filled with the balm of Gilead. Right? Whether he sprouts a rose of Sharon in our life. Doesn't matter. Doesn't affect the vessel. Too often we look at what's in the vessel and judge the vessel for it. That's not how God does it. God sees the vessel and God sees what's in the vessel. You may do everything according to the will of God and what you've planted may not sprout because somebody out there didn't act on it. God doesn't see that as a failure on your part. Look at Jeremiah. 
We don't have a record of one convert, but he did the will of God. God saw the vessel, and God judged the vessel holy and acceptable unto him. We, on the other hand, he may plant in us, he may cook in us, he may dump us, fill us with water and dump us out to quench the thirst of a dying in a lost world. But regardless of what we're used for, our focus should be on the vessel, possessing it, keeping it, so that God can do whatever He wants to with us. To be ready for anything. Whether God desires us to be used in cooking a meal for somebody because they're so famished being out in the world, going after a prodigal in a far country, not right, just to give them a meal to say, hey, God still cares about you back at His house. Whether He just wants us to be filled with Him so He can give a drink to other Christians or lost folk. Doesn't matter what He wants me to use. My focus is on keeping my vessel as God wants it to be. Making up hedges, standing in gaps, filling cracks so that I can hold whatever God puts in me. The lust says, I want people to stop and look at the vase like they do what's in the vase. I don't care if people see me. What God puts in me, that's what's going to shine out. I've just got to make sure that I can handle and be responsible with what God fills me up with. Then verse number 6 says, That no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any matter. What's that mean? That you tell it how it is. And if you say you're going to do something, go do it. Right? Don't be double-tongued. Right? It's the will of God for us to be like Christ was. If He said it, He did it. If He told somebody He loved them, He did. If He told somebody that He'd be there for them, He was. And still is to this day. Because He said that there was a friend that sticked closer than a brother. Who's that? Him. It says, Because the Lord is the avenger of all such, and we also have forewarned you and testified, for God hath not called us unto uncleanliness, but unto holiness. There's that word again. So what do we take from the will of God in First Thessalonians? Well, first it's the will of God for us to be the vessel that He wants us to be. But then to know how to possess it, know how to wield it, that if God t tells you to go out and to water something, you know how to get water in you and then go and dump it out to other people. If God tells you to be filled with prayer, you know how to get a hold of God in heaven. If God tells you to be full of testimony so that you can go out and witness to others, you know how to draw that out of the vessel that God's given you. Because all those things God puts in you. If you desire... Because God's birthed it in your heart to be a witness. God will open doors. But He won't open the doors until you're ready to tell others about Him. God does not call the qualified. He qualifies the called. He's looking for those that are obedient, know how to possess their vessel, and He can use them, folk. He's not waiting for you to become a great teacher or a great singer or you know a great example for the community. And then he would select you out. He says, no. If they've got a vessel that I can use and they're willing to have it wholly sanctified unto me and they know how to use it, doesn't matter how big the vessel is, doesn't matter how small the vessel is, little as much when God's in it. A cup of water is worth a whole lot more than you think it is if you haven't had anything to drink in a while. Ask Esau. He sold his birthright for one meal because he's that hungry. The world selling themselves out for a whole lot less. Just one word, fitly spoken. Can be all the difference. God's not looking for who's the most qualified. He's looking for those that will be most obedient and will do according to His will. Okay, then last place we're going to go. If you want to go there, Romans chapter number 8. This is the last of the specifics we're going to get on. Then I'm going to do a little bit of either rambling or mirandering, one or the other. And then we'll be done. 
Okay, Romans chapter number 8, verse number 28. And we know all things work together for good to them that love God, to them that are called according to His purpose. Okay, there are a lot of people that call themselves to God's purpose, but unless He calls you, all things aren't going to work for your good. Okay, a lot of people say, well, all things work to you know, work together for good to them that love God and then they stop there but there's a comma that means the thought continues but it's just taking a different track there's something else in addition to just loving God you have to be called according to his purpose you can love God all you want to but if you're not in the will of God all things are not going to work together for good for you some things God may orchestrate to work to your hurt so that you realize you need to get back into the will of God had somebody tell me this week, well, as long as you're in the will of God, God will let you use your free will to go out and do what you desire to do. That's not what this says. I'm supposed to be wholly sanctified unto Him. That doesn't mean I'm God's 90% of the time and then I can do what I want 10% of the time. Or as long as I love God, all things are going to work to No, you've got to be in the will of God. Now there's a permissive will of God. God doesn't say you have to read your Bible at this time every day. Right? If you read it as soon as you wake up or after you get dressed and ready and right out before you know you go out the door, I do believe that it's the will of God for me. Can't say this for you, but I do believe it's the will of God. Early will I seek thee, the psalmist said. And if you don't believe that that's important, listen to an annoying song while you're getting ready and then watch that thing will be stuck in your head the rest of the day. You won't be able to get rid of it. If we get our mind on godly things, what's that being transformed by the renewing of our mind? But anyway, if you love God and you're called according to His purpose, in other words, you're doing what God wants you to do, then all things will work together for your good. Okay, but next verse. For whom He did foreknow. What's that saying? Those that He called now, He knew before they got saved that they were going to be saved. He didn't say who, was, who could be saved and who couldn't be saved. God just knows everything. He's all-knowing. And He knew that people would get saved and that He would have a call for their life. That after they got saved, they would do something for Him because they're called by His name. And anything associated with God, He wants it to do the will of God. Okay, so for whom He did foreknow, He also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of His Son. Okay, now that word predestinate, a lot of people will tell you, well, he knew who would get saved, so he predestined who was going to be saved. And who, no. He said, for whom he did foreknow. He knew that some would get saved. And he predestined, or he did predestinate, that those that did get saved would be conformed to the image of his son. That's what God predestinated, that Christ would die, and those that came to God through Christ would look like Christ would be conformed to the model that he set for us. That's what was predestined. Because he was the only begotten, the perfect Lamb of God. The only thing that was acceptable to pay for sins. So after our sins were forgiven, of course God would want us to live to the standard of Christ. It's the only thing that he finds acceptable. Right? Well, right, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. So in this verse, we find out the process of the will of God in your life. Okay? First, you get saved. Right, that's the will of God. Don't you perish, all should come to repentance. Right? Well then, after you get saved, it was predestinated you be conformed to the image of Christ. You know what Christ was? Sanctified, holy unto God perfectly acceptable unto what the will of God was. Okay, that's what that whom he did predestinate. It's predestined that you would look like Christ. Not just for all of eternity when we get a body like his, but here, now, as we live and breathe. Okay? Then it says, then he also called. It's the will of God for you to do something for him. He doesn't tell you to be prepared and put on the whole armor of God so that you can sit on a pew and do nothing. But, but it doesn't say that and whom he did predestinate them the pastor called. 
right or the Sunday school teacher called or the deacon called I can't tell you what God wants you to do only he can and unless you are submissive and receptive for what God wants you to do right you're not going to get any further in this verse because let's be honest if you were conformed to the image of Christ you'd know the will of God in your life you'd know what God's calling you to do and then you'd go out and do it because that's what Christ did Okay, well, then it says, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified. Those that are out doing what God wants them to do, right, he will justify their life before others. We've already been justified for sin. That's done at Calvary. Right, but he will make us into what the world needs to see in us. Well, you say, what's that? Well, for different people, it might be different things. Some have compassion making a difference. Others put the fear of God in them so that they realize that there's a fire in hell and they get saved. Right? There's, we were all different. right? But that's a Holy Ghost job. That's not my job. But when he says justified, he's saying that like Samuel, the prophet, God said of Samuel that none of his words did fall to the ground. In other words, he was always speaking as God would have him to speak, and all of his words hit the mark. They hit the target. Right what God wanted him to do. Right? Samuel wasn't justified. Right? He was under the grace of God at that time, because he did as the law instructed him to do. But he wasn't saved, as we know saved. He didn't have the Holy Ghost in him, but God justified his words to where his words did what God wanted them to do. His actions did what God wanted to accomplish. If we're obedient, God will take care of the rest, is what it's saying. Because it's the will of God that people should win other people, not that angels should come. Well, my actions aren't good enough. Right? I don't compare to... I mean, we've read out of the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter number 6. I can't preach a message that good. Jesus preached about everything that God wanted them people to know. We're still talking about it. Greatest message ever preached. That's recorded at least. You say, what? Well, you think the preacher's going to do better? No, but I believe that God's going to justify what the preacher says. That it'll be just as good as if God came down and told me himself because that's the way that God willed it to be. In other words, it's just as good because God can make it that way. That's what justified means. And yeah, not talking about redemption there. It's talking about God using you to do it as if God did it himself. Because he did do it. Okay, but then he says, in whom he justified, them he also glorified. Now we've already talked about not possessing our vessel after the lust of the flesh. So when he glorifies us, those that are wholly given over to him, really what it's saying is the success that we get, because hey, it's still true, you reap what you sow. You work hard, you labor, you do according to what God says, God, there's going to be fruit. I don't know how much fruit, but there's going to be fruit. Okay, And that fruit, he glorifies our acts, but not to make us puff up itself. No, he glorifies our obedience so that others see he's worth glorifying. We're just doing our best to live as unto the Lord. And as a result, God will show that even though it may not be fruit as the world thinks of fruit, or riches as the world thinks of riches, God will show that when you can't grow anything out there, he can grow something in your vessel. And it glorifies him, not us. Because those that go out and have what they're doing justified by God, the world can't stop it. Gates of hell cannot prevail against the church of the living God. If he called you and you're going out and doing what God told you to do, he'll make sure that when it comes judgment day, it's justified. You did as God wanted you to do. I mean, and then there's the personal will of God for your life. What is it? I don't know. But God knows, and if you ask him, or if you already have asked him, you do know. But if you don't know, you can ask him and he'll tell you. But you know what the one requirement is? Sanctified. Holy given over. You truly desire in your heart to know it, 
and to do it. Not to do it the way that you think it's okay to do it. Do it to God's standard. If you desire that, God will tell you what the will, of, you know, His will is for your life. We know the general will of God. It's the will of God that we should go to the world, tell every living creature that Jesus saves, Jesus saves, like we sang about. That's the will of God. That's the will of God. People be faithful, church. Will of God for people to tithe. Right? We can get into all them things, but see, we already talked about ink on the last chapter is already drying. If we really care, if we really believe that, we'd present ourselves a living sacrifice unto God. Holy and acceptable. Because we know that's the only hope that this world's got. Is if some people get a touch of God on them, and instead of being filled with so anybody in here that's a penny pincher, I could save you a whole lot of money. Right? If you were wholly acceptable unto God, right, you could cancel some of them net subscriptions you got to online things. Because you'd be given to more of Him. You wouldn't have time because you'd be so... Fields are wide unto harvest. Labors are few. You get plugged in. God's got enough for you to do. We won't be satisfied with sitting there just taking in more of what the world has. Right? There'd be one thing that could satisfy us. Doing the will of the Father. Like we talked about with Jesus a few weeks ago. His meat was to do the Father's business. To do the will of God. When that's all that will satisfy you, God will give you more to do. And God will justify what you do for Him. And God will glorify it so that the Son be lifted up and He can draw all men unto Him. But that's the will of God. It's not some mysterious thing. It's the will of God that you look like Jesus, know how to possess your vessel so that you can most look like Jesus as you can, and you go out and be obedient to what God tells you to do not with bitterness, not with envy, not with regret, right? But with soul appreciation and enthusiasm that you get to do something for God. You know why the church doesn't impact the world like it used to? Because there's not many people like that anymore. Very few people that have their vessel and have possession over it so that God can fill them with so much God that when they walk into factories, people get under conviction and start begging God to save them just because somebody walked in the room. That when they preach, people from miles around get the inclination to go for a drive, and then when they drive past the church, they fall under so much conviction that they pull up under the carport, come running in and ask somebody to show them how to be saved. Things like that used to happen. Used to, when people that had a touch of God prayed, God heard. Because they had their vessel, they knew how to possess it, and they also said, Lord, I'm not praying this that my will be done, but thy will be done. And God honored it because they were already prepared to give God the glory for it. All that being said, if you really thought that we was at the end of it, if you really thought that the will of God was that important, you'd do it. It's that simple. If you're not that way, I'd ask the Holy Ghost to convict you of what the will of God is and how important it is so that you're convinced that it's worth paying attention to. Do you struggle to find good Bible-based resources to supplement your personal devotions? If so, head on over to ibcflorence.com today and click on Bookstore where we have a ton of resources. And as always, thanks for listening.